are people here? And stopping talking and getting ready to listen to a cool presentation. Woo! But before that, I'm speaking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Mark Atwood, and he's going to talk about open source jobs, and he seems pretty cool. He is the cool presentation, but there might be another one next. I'm sure there'll be another one. Who knows? Anyway, big round of applause for Mark. Thank you. So this is the first time I've given this talk outside of the United States, and because it is about employment, there are a lot of um, localisms and regionalisms. I've tried to extract and change most of the US-centric ones out, but some, I'm sure I missed some. So translate appropriately for Australia, New Zealand, or wherever else you're from. Um, like the slide says, my name is Mark Atwood. Um, I have a fancy title, which is the Director of Open Source Engagement at Hewlett Packard, um, which means mostly I get to come travel around and do this sort of thing. Um, you can email me with questions. My email address is right there. Um, the fact that my email address is easy to find and read is something that I'm going to touch on several times in this talk. Um, HP is very heavily involved in open source, not just in doing things like um, sponsoring conferences like LCA, but um, about one out of five HP servers coming out of one of our factories has Linux pre-installed on it. Um, the, we're not sure since no one announces the numbers quite this way, but when we scrape other people's um, ship numbers, announce numbers, we think that we are actually the fastest we, um, we are making more Linux servers per second than anybody else. Um, well, yeah, there are multiple seconds between each one, but, but, yeah, but yes. Um, it's other projects that HP and myself are heavily involved in are OpenStack and Cloud Foundry. We're part of the KVM Foundation. And um, we have also just hired Keith Packard to, um, away from Intel to be the chief architect on the port of Linux to the machine. So if any of you are interested in um, hyperscale computing and, and or have done Linux kernel hacking, please go talk to Keith and give him your resume. Um, it's, I'm also going to be a little bit more meta in this talk than I normally am since I usually give this talk in um, small regional schools of um, people from very impoverished areas. And I'm giving, I give this talk as how to get a job and then how to get this awesome job. And I think probably a significant number of you already have open source jobs. And so instead, I want some play off with you guys as we as some discussion back and forth about it's how, is how to understand how you got that job and how to communicate to other people how to get into this world. And I'm sure some of you don't have open source jobs, please pay attention. I think this is actually a pretty effective way of doing it. it you do work, right? Ha. So, as I said, HP is hiring. The operative URL is hp.com slash jobs. Um, hiring all sorts of fields and areas. However, I cannot juice or expedite your application. One of the problems and one of the great things about being a truly mind-bendingly light large corporation is everything is wrapped around a process and it's not terribly fast. But do please submit your application and your resume. Um, Happiness and success and jobs and career and all good things are not guaranteed. Um, and this talk is a syllabus, not a textbook, which means I'm going to tell you the things you need to go research on your own rather than spend a lot of time specifically teaching you the things you need to know. Um, the most important word in that phrase for the sake of this talk is the last one, job. It is a job. On the plus side, that means salary and having a career and paying the bills and supporting your lifestyle and supporting your family and having corporate benefits um, and that sort of thing. It also has all these standard downsides of have, being a job. Hard work, long hours, they have lots of frustrations with coworkers um, and all the frustrations of working for an employer or a corporation um, still is the case. But working in open source is better than most jobs. Um, you know, some of the intangible benefits are you actually you will feel really good about the work you do. Um, you pick the right kind of project and you, and you actually get a real sense that you're making the world a better place. Um, and then far more practically, you're much, you're much less subject to corporate whims. Um, a job restructuring, a layoff, a bankruptcy, a change in direction does not 
does not screw you up as much as it does if you're working most of the other kind of work, especially proprietary software development. Um, the other cool thing about open source employment is it tends toward distributed work, especially with um, the development of things like um, Git from our friend Linus um, and the um, $2 trillion that we as a society over the last 40 years has spent building the internet. You probably don't have to move to San Francisco or New York or Melbourne. Um, but you can if you want to, and it actually makes it easier to do that if you want to. Um, when you work in open source, you will have really great coworkers. Um, my own experience is, is I've had good coworkers and some of my dearest friends, including some who are here at LCA, I got to know because I worked in open source. And this experience seems kind of universal for the people who get involved in it. So now I'm going to talk about some of the things you need to know. The first one is not your technical skills. It is your communication skills. You have to learn how to write. Um, you have to learn how to write clearly, and you have to learn how to write in English. Um, even if English is not your first language or the language of um, your nation, the language of technology and the language of software development is English. And sadly, most is my experience is many people whose, na whose native language is English are not as good at it as people who learned it as a second language but you have to learn how to be clear at it. You have to learn how to speak. Um, even if you want to spend all of your time heads down hacking over some editor, you have to actually get up and talk to other people about what you're doing. So I recommend you learn how to do this. Stand up and talk to people with the microphone. You have to learn how to stand up and talk at the head of the table. You need to learn how to um, talk and communicate when you're sitting around a conference table or over a desk together at a cafe. Um, it can be terrifying for some people. There are places to go to learn how to do it. Um, do you have Toastmasters in Australia or New Zealand? Yes. All right, excellent. I figured they were worldwide. That is, if you really, really want a, um, a fast and good way to learn how to do that, if you can't, don't take to it naturally, I do recommend Toastmasters. The next trick is to be reachable. You have to have a public email address. One of the constant frustrations of my job is, is, I need, is when I need to reach out to somebody who has said something or has had, made some comment or made some contribution or made a tweet or something, I can't find their email address. Make your email address findable, please. Um, and finally, the most important thing on this slide, and I'm going to repeat this on several others, is don't be a jerk. Um, your reputation is very hard to change. And um, if you have a reputation as a jerk, it gets very hard to work with other people. And the way that open source works is you work with other people. And from the technical skills, um, step number zero is learn how to program. Um, a couple of times I've met people who want to get involved in this cool thing who don't know how to code. Um, learn how. Um, most of you probably do. If you don't, two languages I recommend you start with are um, Python, because it's easy to learn, easy to read, and lots of things are built with it, and JavaScript. And JavaScript is possibly my least favorite programming language, and true probably for many of you as well. However, the thing is everywhere. So those are the first two to learn. Um, but don't stop there. Don't, as learn other languages. Don't fear weirdness. Some that I have um, that I particularly like recommending are um, Scala and Erlang and Clojure and this weird language called C and C++. That was strange. Um, in addition, the part of learning the language is not just the syntax, but learning how to use the debugger and the IDE. And print statements in your code is not debugging. Um, learn how to use Git really well. Git is more than just keeping, um, keeping your code backed up for yourself. Git is actually a collaboration tool. When you use Git right, it is one of the things that you're using to communicate with other developers. And sometimes that other developer is yourself in the future. Um, and then the final technical thing, which I'm going to tell you to go research rather than tell you how to do it, is learn how to code to test. Write your code so that Jenkins or some CI system will constantly be continuous integration testing it. Um, as, you get for, as you start getting involved in various open source projects, the ones that you're going to find most easiest to get involved in are ones that are running continuous integration. Um, if you get involved in one that doesn't do continuous integration, once you have enough standing there, become a champion for doing CI. It does really make a difference. 
and then back away from hard skills to back to soft skills, the relationships and your peers. Um, we learn from each other. It's you will learn things from people who teach you things you don't know, and you also learn by teaching them things. Um, just explaining a project, explaining a problem to someone else is the best way to learn it yourself. The way to find people, you know, meetups, hacker spaces, schools, uni. Um, you need a mix of both local people to work with, and you also need to learn how to work remotely with remote people. And the way you find remote people is conferences like this. Again, the internet. Um, one particular site I like re recommending to people is Stack Overflow, a question, technical question answer site. How many of you have a Stack Overflow account? Awesome, about half. The rest of you should probably sign up. Um, and again, I'm going to reiterate, as you're working with people face-to-face -face and um, remotely, again, don't be a jerk. The world is really small. Um, as a um, personal example, um, is several years ago, I was the um, community manager for a system called um, OpenShift. In fact, I presented it here at LCA. And now, several years later, I helped put together the open source governance for OpenShift's competition, Cloud Foundry. Um, so it's, even when it's competition, it's always the honored competition. You never get personal. You never become a jerk. You never really get angry about it. The world is small. You're, always, you're going to be working with the same people at different jobs and different projects for decades. Now to the work. Here's the catch for getting the job. We're going to talk more about getting the job. You have to start doing the work before you get the job. You can't get the job and then start doing the work. Um, and the way you do that is pretty simple. You find a project or two or three. GitHub is full of them. You will have your own itches you want to scratch or projects that your friends are working on. Fix a bug. Fix a bug in the documentation. This will get you involved. It'll show you how that project does their cycle, does their contribution process, and just keep doing that. As your skills increase, two things are happening. Your skills are increasing, and other people will see that you have those skills. Once you become pretty, um, well known enough, you will get higher and higher standing in those projects. And the, uh, it turns into a virtuous cycle of both technical work and collaboration. Your collaboration tools. How many of you routinely use IRC? About half, good. Most open source projects use IRC for their real time work, um, mostly on free nodes. Some projects use something else, but mostly it's IRC. Um, each project has a bug tracker you need to learn how to use. Some of them are as um, not so great as um, Bugzilla. Some of them are moderately awesome. Some of them are great, but they're all a little different, and you need to learn the one for your project. Um, again, I'm going to reiterate, learn how to use Git. It's more than check-in, check-out. It's talk to, um, find local Git experts. Use Git to talk to yourself. Use Git to talk to people and other pro um, across your project. Once it starts to sink into your head, you'll wonder how you did without it. Um, and then the closest thing we have to a silver bullet, and it works better in um, open source than it does in proprietary software development, is pair programming. That's when one of you works at a keyboard and does coding well. Um, your um, pair sits behind you over your shoulder and talks to you about what you're doing, and you talk to them about, what you're, about what you're doing, and then after an hour you swap positions. There's usually a local meetup on pair programming or pair agile programming, um, so you can go practice this. If you are good at programming or if you are really smart, you're going to find this very, very hard to do. It is my experience that people who are moderately good at this or just, or just starting out take to it very well. People with a lot of experience or a lot of smarts hate it, but even if you, if, if you don't like it, you should do it anyway. It will make you a better programmer and let you generate better and more um, software faster. So like I said, as you're doing all this, two things are happening. Your skill sets are growing. You're getting better at programming. You're getting better at your projects. And your reputation is growing. And it's the reputation that you need to get the job. Um, the way I do this breakdown is um, portfolio versus resume. I have looked at a lot of resumes. Some of them look great, some of them not so great. One of them, but um, the thing is, is I've seen people with mediocre skills with really great resumes, and I've seen people with really great skills with really bad resumes. So re I've learned resumes are not entirely trustworthy. 
but a portfolio. When you're working in open source software, when you go hunting for a job, you can point someone at your GitHub account. Or when you're doing the job interview, you can go over code that you've written. Um, artists and creatives have been doing this for centuries. It's now awesome that we as developers can do it as well. Um, I have never met a good programmer with a um, bad portfolio, and I have never met someone with a bad portfolio who is a good programmer. Work on your portfolio. Um, part of that reputation, sadly, is social media. Um, you do have to be reachable. You don't have to dump your entire life onto Facebook and post pictures of your kids and compromise your privacy, but do be findable and reachable, both by email, show up on LinkedIn, show up on whatever social media sites work appropriately for your, for your interests and for where you live, but don't be a complete cipher. On then on getting the job, how do you find it? The cool thing is, is once you have some of a reputation as open source developer, the jobs will seek you out. Um, recruiters now know how to scan through GitHub and they scan through LinkedIn. If you keep those up to date, keywords and the projects you're involved in will trip their searches and you will start getting offers. Um, it's kind of magical. Um, even more importantly, your peers will refer you. It's someone who you've worked with for a while on some project will send you an email saying, hey, my company's got a position open that looks like the kind of stuff you were doing. Why don't you apply? It's usually a big win for both of you because they get a referral bonus and you get a new job. <laughs> um, it's come to conferences like this. You'll notice about half or more of the talks, including this one, will end with the um, slide we're hiring. Is take them at their word. Sin is um, if what that, um, what that um, speaker and that company is doing has anything to do with what you're interested in, do send in your resume. Um, now, once that happens, you get called in for an interview, and I'm not going to talk to you about how to do a technical interview because we'll be here for hours. There's lots of online resources and other talks on how to do that. Different companies do that differently. Um, but I'm going, to talk to, I'm going to mention one important thing. Once you pass the technical interview and they decide they want to hire you, they're going to give you an offer letter. An offer letter is, is the first step of a negotiation. So raise your hands. How many of you have ever gotten an offer letter? should be nearly everybody. Okay, how many of you counter-offered your offer letter? About half. And I'm very impressed. It's almost, it's, I almost never see a woman raise her hand. So congratulations. Um, it is my personal working theory that that difference is a significant fraction of the reason of the um, stubborn um, income um, differential between men and women, is, is that for some reason women don't send an offer letter back. When you get the offer letter, they've decided they want to hire you, and now you're dickering over price. It's, you will dicker over the price of buying a house or buying a car, but dickering over the price of your wages over time makes a bigger, very much bigger difference in your income and your wealth than saving money buying something. Counter offer. Um, it can be kind of terrifying. What if they don't like me? What if I ask too much? There's, again, lots of resources online and people you can talk to on how to do it, but at least send the counter offer back. The worst thing that can happen really is, well, the worst thing that can happen is they withdraw the offer, but that's vanishingly unlikely to happen. While instead, the worst thing that will happen is, you know, for various reasons, be large company, government agency, financial reasons, um, this is the price we have to stick to, and even if that's where you end up, you're not any worse off. And they'll actually be more impressed with you that you are willing to dicker over this sort of thing and be thoughtful about it. The other thing I want to talk to is once you have the offer and you've signed the offer, um, this is something, is, is these statements are slightly U.S.-centric. This is something you're going to have to do local research for. Um, when you work for a technology company, modulo the contract you sign and the laws of the country you're in, they own your brain, more or less. So if you want to keep working on open source, you need to decide how much of the work that you're going to do on open source will belong to your employer and how much of the work in open source that is not directly related to the job that you have will still go to your employer. Um, in the United States, uh, most offer letters and offer contracts have an, what's called an Appendix B, where you list all of the intellectual property that you already own 
that you're not assigning to your employer that you can keep working on. Most people ignore this part and leave it blank. Don't. Keep track of the projects that you work on. Keep track of the projects you're interested in. Keep that appendix filled out and up to date. Hopefully, it will never become an issue. But if it ever becomes an issue, you'll be glad that you had that all set up ahead of time, that you continue to own the IP that you generate for the projects you work on. Once you have the job, how many of you have worked an 80-hour work week? How, good did you, how well did you do on that, in those 80 hours? Yeah. Is what happens if you keep working 80-hour work weeks? How good is your work? How good is your health? How many of you routinely work 60-hour work weeks? Yeah. Okay, don't. The reason why the 40-hour work week exists is less about the rights of workers and union negotiation and modernization of approaches and stuff, but it's actually something that dates back to research being, that was done by Henry Ford, and he discovered that 40 hours a week is that sweet spot where you can keep up the maximum output indefinitely. He experimented with working with his workers, 30-hour weeks, 50-hour weeks, 45-hour weeks, 70-hour weeks. Um, his workers burned out at 45 hours a week or above, and their quality and throughput dropped, but they could work forever at 40, hour, 40 hours a week. This is a lesson that has to keep being relearned about every 30 years as each new industry comes along and says, well, we're not building cars, we're doing this. We're doing this, or we're running games, or we're designing bridges, or we're digging ditches. It's always 40 hours a week. Um, if you ever find yourself working 60 hours a week, understand you can only do it for a few weeks at a time. If you ever find yourself working 80 hours a week, you had better have real equity in the startup, or you'd better be in a combat zone. <laughs> and if that is the case, the number one job of your founders or funders or your commanding officer is to get your workload down before you really hurt yourself or hurt somebody else. So don't overwork. It's really not worth it. And it will wreck your health. And it will wreck your health in ways that will take years to recover. Um, on a related note, junk food. Just say no. Whether, whether, whether you do Soylent or you go vegan or you count your calories or something, um, chips and soda are something that's notorious in our industry and it is killing us. So figure out a way to stop doing it and stop doing it. Um, and then back to jerks. Instead of don't be a jerk, don't work for jerks. Working for jerks is highly stressful, and that kind of stress is bad for your heart and bad for your mind. There are many bosses and startup founders who think that because Steve Jobs was a jerk, he was successful. There, Therefore, they should be a jerk like Steve Jobs. Um, no, they're not Steve Jobs. They're just jerks. <laughs> and one of the cool things about being working in open source is it does make you more flexible on where you can work. So you can actually fire your boss, go to work for another company, and keep working on the same project. Um, don't do it unless you don't have to, but again, don't work for a jerk. Money. This is something where I go on for um, usually five or ten minutes, but I'm going to have to excise most of it since a lot of it is US-centric. Um, the high points there are if you are in debt, once you have that job, get out of debt. Again, that goes back to um, getting rid of your stress so you can do, be a better developer. Um, and max your, your savings out. Um, I have a bunch of stuff here that's US-centric on the way to save for retirement, which um, sadly I have to put into a talk on technology and jobs because people pay, don't pay attention to it. Um, I don't know what the terminology is in New Zealand and Australia, but whatever the equivalent of an IRA and 401k is, max your contribution out. Superannuation. All right, superannuation. Yeah. Um, and then on startups, um, is when you get involved in technology and software development, you may consider going to work for a startup. Um, they can be very exciting. Um, they are death to your health. Um, it's, it may be worth it. Um, if you decide to go to work for a startup, do not kill yourself for a nickel. A nickel is 5% of 1% of the value of the company. And there are lots of 
bright-eyed, intelligent, bushy-tailed young men and women in the various Silicon Valleys around the world who are killing themselves for a nickel. That's not real equity. Don't kill yourself for a nickel. Have real equity if you're going to do that. Or if you go work for a startup and, you, and they're offering you a nickel, don't take, a pay, don't take the pay cut. Insist on industry wages or go to work in industry. Um, And then finally, and unsurprisingly, do keep learning. Um, it's, I think I've gone through eight or nine different language cycles since I started doing software development. Um, those of the rest of you who have done development will see the same thing happening. You can't stop learning or you'll get left behind. And the cool thing is, is if you keep learning, you don't only stay in one place, you get better and better. And you get better at learning more things faster, which makes it easier to get the next job, the next project, the next project, the next job. And then finally, I have a recommendation for three books. How many of you read that first book? About a third. The rest is, you definitely should all read the first one. How many of you read the second book? Again, I really strongly recommend it. The third book, I, that, that was what I was reading in my off time at LCA last year in Perth. Um, it is astoundingly good. Um, Scott Adams, as in the Dilbert guy. It's... Um, he starts out by the book by saying, do not take life advice from a cartoonist. <laughs> On the other hand, here's a bunch of things that worked for him, and it is really an awesomely good book on getting a better job, having a better life, and taking care of yourself while you do it. And then, like I promised in the very last slide, HP is hiring, hp.com slash jobs. Um, HP does many, many things all around the world. We have a pretty big footprint in Australia and New Zealand. Um, we do both open and proprietary software, manufacturing, sales, marketing. Whatever sort of job you can think of, we do it, and we're probably hiring for it. Okay, any questions? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, more from... You mentioned about IP. Yes. Um, Again, that's highly localized for, your, for whatever, um, for local employment law where you are and the contract you sign. So if it gets, if it gets beyond, be, um, please uh, watch out, is, if any answer beyond be aware of this sort of thing, I have to, to go talk to a labor lawyer for the jurisdiction you're working in. Correct. Therefore, let's make it global. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, do you offer actually advice while you are hiring? Because at the end of the day, this is a negotiation. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a little bit strange that you actually advise me how to negotiate with you, but it will be always cheaper for me to have your so-called free advice mm -hmm. in terms of understand better. So I'm wearing a couple of different hats here. I'm only partially wearing a hat of, um, of uh, representing HP. Um, I mean, HP is an awesome company. It's one of the better companies I've worked for. You know. It would be better for HP if I, if I um, gave advice that was the cheapest for the company, but I'm actually here instead representing uh, my fellow open source peers and peers to be, um, which is the reason why I offer the advice. Be aware of the IP issues. Be able to negotiate that yourself or understand what you're negotiating. I don't know if that, if that quite answered your question, but... It's an HP, HP style answer. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. just ahead. another question. Languages. You mentioned uh, normal languages. And, Python and JavaScript. Yes. And Erlang closure. Erlang Can closure you give me a, a view towards, I don't know, Julia or other kind of things? Are you? It's a little bit of more corporate question, but why are you recommending this? So the reason why I recommend JavaScript is that it is everywhere. Um, and not necessarily the um, document object model, JavaScript in a browser, but things like Node.js on the back end, JavaScript on the client. Um, okay, so it's not my favorite language, but it's everywhere, and everyone has to have some exposure to it. The reason why I recommend Python is probably the um, fastest non-toy language to learn to read and learn to write that you can do real workload in. Um, if you are good at Python, that is 90% of the way to getting involved in doing development in OpenStack and Cloud Foundry. Those are written uh, primarily in Python. Um, Pyth is, so I recommend Python just because the ease of learn and ease of becoming usable, useful at it. Um, 
Once you get those two under your belt, it turns into what one scratch your itch or what language is used by the project that you're involved in. And probably the next important one to learn is C or C++. Um, or if you're in a much more Microsoft-oriented world, um, C Sharp and the common, common language runtime, um, or Java and other JVM-based languages, or if you're one, you're feeling really academic and you want to really set your brain on fire, languages like Haskell. Um, but I really don't have any strong advice on which path to take other than you should probably start with JavaScript and Python. Any other questions? Yes. Hey, uh, first of all, thanks for once again touching on health mm -hmm. as being a major issue. Um, it seems to be a common theme among a number of talks. Uh, from a talk I went to yesterday from uh, the uh, ladies down in front there, it came up that a lot of people do get jobs via people they know and I suppose a bit of nepotism and such. So you are essentially advocating for that to encourage people to go out and actually be more sociable, even though IT people are generally a bit more introverted? Is yeah, it's, um, it's, it's the, uh, it is the most effective way to sell a product is word of mouth, and sometimes, that, and sometimes the product, in this case, is a job opening or a job applicant. Um, the bet is you typically don't get really good jobs by going through the big online jobs databases. It's almost always done well better through referral um, and may sometimes seem unfair or you wish it could be more automated or, or, or have less human messiness involved in it, but it is what it is. And the best way to get referred for a job is to be more social and more sociable. Um, it's, again, we could have an, a, another talk on how to be more social, more sociable, and that would consume hours and days. Um, it's uh, my own experience is I'm actually an introvert. I, I, it takes energy for me to talk to people and be social. And it's after I do a, a um, conference like this, I have to go home and be myself by myself alone for a day to, um, to recompress. Um, but even when you're an introvert, you can still go out and talk to people. It's easier to talk to other introverts or hang out with other geeks and developers. But yeah, I am specifically recommending going out and being social with the kind of people who can refer you to the job that you want to get. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Just wondering how to, what's the best way to get better at some language? Is a cloning a project and start working on it or it's there there but how to get better at a particular language um, you know, the, the very the, the very start is just find some good on, online tutorials for that language um, my experience is I, is I typically do that for a while and then I find somebody who knows the language and ask to pair with them so I do really basic programming while they look over my shoulder and correct me um, and then it just turns into a matter of practice. I know some um, extremely talented professional programmers that um, take sort of a martial arts approach to it, where they'll sit down each morning and do katas. They'll do solve very basic logic problems and programming problems in some language using some new technique. Um, is they'll read about some technique in a language, that, and then they'll sit and write basic um, problems and, and basic programs, even ones they'll throw away in that technique until they get comfortable with it. And then it's just, it just turns into a matter of just doing more and more. Um, it's like all skills, it gets better with practice. And um, one, of the thing is, one of the things that I've learned from, um, both from learning how to program and other skills that I've worked on is, is you have to practice and you have to practice with intent. And you have to think about what you're doing while you're practicing. And it's painful and slow and you wish you were smarter, but you have to put in the hours and the focus and then you will get better at it. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Yes. Hi, my name is Andrew. Uh, in some of our uh, favorite open source projects, like mm -hmm. in the kernel, for example, the, the learning curve is very, very steep. It is. Could you uh, say a few words about um, how many of the developers who, 
who landed an open source job um, had some kind of mentored, mentored by someone versus uh, the number of people who have basically had to bootstrap themselves. Uh, mentoring versus bootstrapping. This, this is something that um, I think as an industry we're making a transition in. Ten minutes, all right. Um, it used to be that nearly all software developers had to bootstrap. Um, until they got to until they got to uni and then and then they mentored each other, um, we're starting to make a, a um, change more towards more mentoring, less bootstrapping, which I think is a good thing because there are lots of people out there who ultimately will be very skilled, who the skill of being a good developer and the skill of being a good open source developer and the skill of being a good employee are not necessarily the same skill as being able to bootstrap a very te difficult technical skill. Um, if you can bootstrap, you should. Even if you can, you should seek out a mentor. Um, ways, you find mentors the same way you find peers. You go to the places that where there are people doing the things that you want to learn. Um, if you start pairing with people, you'll find out, you may find somebody who can mentor you. Um, it's, you can sometimes even just ask. If you, find, if you come across somebody who you think can teach you something really useful, you can ask them, can you mentor me? Can you, or a couple of hours a week in exchange for this, or sometimes in exchange, just people who are skilled like to teach. And um, you may find somebody who can help you learn. Um, as the, the, um, the Linux kernel as a, um, as a project is um, very technically demanding, both for, as a language, as a complex project, and as a complex open source environment. It is one of the uh, most complicated ones. Um, if you want to get involved in open source, the Linux kernel is probably not the place to start. Um, pick one of the other projects, get some skills there, learn the right language, and then, you, and, and then if you want, work towards being a contributor to the Linux kernel. Um, I'm trying to think of any other large, well-known project that is more difficult than the Linux kernel. Um, yes? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that's really true. I think, it, I think the Linux kernel is There's, there's stuff in there that isn't that complicated and needs help. And it does need help. There it, is, it, is, it is harder to find it than if you pick a smaller project that has very obvious limitations. There's no such stuff like general care and that sort of thing. So that's, that's true. There's been a lot of stuff going on about yeah. And the other thing is, when you're looking for the projects that are active, uh, mm -hmm. so, so that there are projects out there that... Um, like one one of the interesting challenges with a lot of the open source stuff is like we're there to solve our own problems, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time you're kind of like going. You figure out if we can get more people in, then that gives us more bandwidth to get more done. Yes, but it's spending time now on mentoring people. That's time you're not spending <laughs> getting stuff done. That 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 um, that that, that and that's so, true, and it's and that's a, and a different talk as well. Some of the projects I've been in, they we we've had to make that this, this determination between we have these prob these um, these particular bugs to fix. Do we have our expert people do it, or we have them slow down and mentor new people to do it for? <laughs> Pay, um, is doing stuff in the future, more uh, mentoring more people in and having more stuff done in the future, and um, this th this is a balance back and forth and a transition again that we as industry are making that I'm looking forward to seeing how it ends up. Um, but yeah, it's it, I may have overspoken about how difficult it is to get into the Linux kernel. Um, I'm glad there is the the um, kernel janitors project to help people get into it. Well, the uh, other. So there's kernel janitors there's mm -hmm. for some people. There's also outreach program for women that uh, every twice a year has a group that goes through. The other um, approach is to start mm -hmm. your own project. Yes. Um, which um, has, uh, I mean, you're, you're one of many people, and who knows if you'll, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, you don't have to worry about your fixes and changes getting accepted. That's true. Um, and that's both a good thing and a bad thing. I've seen indeed. I, 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 I've seen projects started by one developer who. Um, it's the great thing about the project is it's got to move fast because the um, core. The problem with the project is after after it grew to a particular size, um, maybe some of the core de uh, initial developers patches shouldn't have landed for review, and 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 making that transition is always a bit rocky. Are there any other questions? All right. Oh, yes. You're in the back. 
Okay, um, for those who probably um, aren't um, up to skills, up to date with programming and coding and stuff like that, but want to um, participate in open source, may, may be into the documentation. Documentation, yes. Side of things or testing, things like that. Is Does that um, add any value when you're looking for a job or anything? It like does, that? it does. Um, is being able to write test cases and do test management or do documentation um, has, is, is getting more and more important with, soft, with um, open source software development, especially projects that have a company attached to them. Um, one of the things that I, I, I skipped in my slides is many of the big projects have companies associated with them, which makes it e um, so you tend to start looking for jobs in those companies. And such projects typically have open source documentation projects attached. And um, then is um, documentation work requires at, le at least as much as, if not more, collaboration, collaboration skills than, than the, um, writing the code does. Um, but it doesn't typically doesn't require learning the programming language. It just requires to be able to communicate clearly and be able to write well. Um, and it just likes for software development, doing documentation work, again, it feeds into your portfolio. You can point and say, I did this. Here's my, here's my skill at editorial work. The cool thing there is that not only can get you work in um, open source development, that could just get you work in doing technical documentation anywhere if you can show what, how good of an editor and how good of a writer you are by showing your portfolio. Anything else? Yes, sorry. First of all, I'd like to plus one that answer because that was really good as a documentation person. Um, we talked a little bit about the technical hurdles to get over, um, especially the Colonel with the earlier questions. Um, what's your take on social and community issues and those kinds of hurdles? Ah, it's Sorry, that's a big question. It is a big one. It's in its, in its own set of talks. Um, it's, um, I used to have lots and lots of slides on this topic, and it, it vanishes down either a rat hole or a bike shed or, or discussions that, don't ha that um, become unfruitful very quickly. So that's the reason why I encapsulated it in just don't be a jerk. Um, it's to expand that a little bit. Sometimes um, is it, don't be a difficult person to work with, but you're going to have to work with difficult people. Um, it's assume goodwill and the lack of malice on the part of other people, um, even if it's demonstrably untrue. It still is better for your health and your skills and your career to assume goodwill and be able to work with people who are hard to work with. Um, it's. I said this is something that I could go. It, we we could discuss for hours, and sometimes it's fruitful, and sometimes it's not. Some people are hard to work with. Some people are excessive, are um, apparently overly focused on the project they're working on, and less focused on the niceties of social interaction. Um, you have to work with them. People are getting better at it, but it is what it is, and. Um, while it's very important, one of the things I do is I take a very zen approach to it. It's just work. It's just technology. It's not something important like, say, your family. All right. I think we're out of time. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, Again, if you have any follow-on questions, you all saw my email address. And if you want to work for Hewlett Packard, it's hp.com slash jobs. Awesome, so another huge round of applause for Mark. Now on behalf of the LCA team and all of everyone around here, we have a small gift for you as Thank a massive you. thanks for your talk. Presentation. Thank you very much.